So now that we understand how scientists would view cell structure using microscopy, using those microscopes that we mentioned and the features of those microscopes, we can finally look at and start talking about cells themselves. And this is going to be a pretty short flowchart, but it's important to give us some nice background information on cells. We've all heard of the term cells, and we can define it very simply as the smallest unit that can carry functions of life. So we'll write that down. The smallest unit that can carry, we'll say life's functions. Life is defined by about, I think, five or six characteristics that show and tell us that something is living. The cell is the single smallest unit that is something that exemplifies life. And remember, we talked about the origin of life. Cells are the most simple and smallest unit that gives us life and fulfills the definition of life. Cells can be two things. They can be either or. They can, they can be, let's say, two types of things uh, and two types of states, let's say. They can be single-celled or what's the opposite of single-celled? They can be multicellular. This is all simple information, but it provides us a good basis because now we can start understanding that multicellularity, single cellularity, involved very small structures, right? Think of bacteria. Think of very small cells, one single heart cell, let's say, or one single lung cell. These are small. Multicellularity, um, let's say, involves bigger things. All right. It means that you are inherently going to be bigger if you have more cells. I know this is very obvious material, but you're also going to be more complex if you're bigger. That's just something that happens in terms of biology and cell structure. So cells can be either single cell or multicellular. In addition, one thing that is probably going to be a bit of new information to us as biology students in college is the fact that all cells, and we'll write this down, all cells all cells have what is known as a common evolutionary ancestor. A common evolutionary ancestor. What does that mean? That basically means that all cells come from the original cell, let's say. There was one original cell. Remember how we talked in the origin of life about how all of these things, these events, let's say the chemical evolution, then the organic molecules and then organic polymers, all these things led up to life developing. Cells all came from one cell, let's say. One cell that was the first thing to show life's functions, to show the ability to live and be a living thing. There was one common evolutionary ancestor that gave rise to everything. So you might think, how is this possible? How do we see the most complex things like the human brain full of different cells and neurons? How do we see this complexity even though we all came from this common evolutionary cellular ancestor? Well, you can simply state that modifications happened. And these modifications happened throughout evolutionary time. So modifications occurred um, throughout evolutionary history. Let me just fix that spelling throughout evolutionary history. It took uh, about, what did we say? I remember, I believe it was about 3.5 or 3.6 billion years ago in which we saw the first remnants of life. Think about all that time until now for these modifications to happen. That's why we see increasing complexity and not just the same old common evolutionary ancestor that we just mentioned. One other thing I want to mention about cells, this is basic background information about cells. When we're studying cells, specifically cell structure, there's one thing that scientists do. It's called fractionation. They fractionize cells. This basically means that in order to study cells, now that we've established basic ideas behind what cells are and where they come from, in order to further study them, we have to fraction them. We have to sort of split them off. And fraction is, fractionation is defined as simply when we take cells 
um, apart in order to separate major organelles. What we're going to be doing, and I want you to imagine this as we go through cell structure, is that we're basically going through a living cell and we're looking at every part of it that gives it its life, that gives it its function. A good way that scientists are able to do this is through this process of fractioning off specific parts of the cell so that we can see the organelles that are of focus. How does this happen? There's a specific actual method that scientists use to fraction off, let's say, um, parts of the cell. And that method involves a couple of different things. Um, basically, step one would be that the cell is homogenized in a blender. So we'll say cell homogenized or cells homogenized in blender. So this is exactly what it sounds like. You take a bunch of cells and you make them homogenized. You even them out. You get rid of all these impurities. A good way to get rid of the impurities of cells is to actually, right after homogenizing, you centrifuge. So we centrifuge. Centrifuge means you put it into a structure that spins very, 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 very fast for a very quick amount of time so that you get what is known as a supernatant. A supernatant is sort of the liquid that's going to come off on the top of the centrifuge. So you can imagine a test tube like this. And what's going to happen is you're going to throw in the cells and homogenize them. At the end, you're going to have some solids that are going to be at the bottom of the test tube. And on the top, right over here, you can imagine that this area right here, this lined area, is our supernatant. This is a liquid that's uh, on the top, that floats to the top because we centrifuge. And it's called the supernatant. The supernatant will be poured off because it doesn't have those solid structures that we're looking for. Remember, this was a cell, and these are solid cell structures. These are just liquid components of the cell that we don't really want anymore. So that supernatant is poured off, and we centrifuge again. So we subject it to this fast spinning environment one more time. And we do this over and over and over again until um, we can say, let's see, I don't have room, but let's put it over here, step four. What happens is we're going to have pellets form. Imagine this being one of the pellets. Pellets, and they will have cell components with cell components. And now we've isolated the parts of the cell, the structural parts of the cell, and now we can look at them in, let's say, with a microscope, an easy way to understand cell structure. So overall, we now understand that cells are the smallest unit that carry life's function. Um, in addition to that, they can be single-celled or multicellular. They all come from this common evolutionary ancestor that over time developed many, 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 many interesting and uh, positive modifications to help advance complexity. And a good way to study cell structure, because this is what our lecture is about, structure of the cell, is to fraction it off. We can take the cells apart and look at major organelles through this process right over here so that we finally end up with specific cell components.